So my question is, uh, you inhabit the bombarded no man's land between the poles, bounding eco-political discourse. <coughs> Can you talk a little more about the criticism you've received from both conservatives and progressives and <coughs> challenges these pose to you personally or professionally? Well, um, you know, people say the middle is a safe place. I always get accused of being like safe <laughs> by not taking a strong position. And it's actually way more dangerous in the middle than being at either end because they all have nice barricades set up and they all have brick walls that they've been building for a long time. But if you're in the, if you're crossing between these camps or among the camps, it's not just two; it's like many different kinds. It is harder. It's it's harder. Um, it's also harder to get an audience. Believe it or not, I could my blog could be would be more widely read if it was a um, more of a fringe, you know, more like a all nukes blog or a, or a no nukes blog or a, or a, you know kind of a, a climate hawk blog um, but because I'm trying I mean my advocacy is for reality you know most of us most of us including me you know by nature we we don't really want reality because reality is complicated we like to have it all distilled down and um, simpler and there's not a big audience for that so it's hard it is hard and I mean just to give you a sense of how this can work out uh, in 2009 I don't know if you look, look back that far. That's when um, Rush Limbaugh, after I had said something about uh, population growth in the context of, of carbon dioxide emissions, he went on his radio show and told his 15 million listeners that, well, Mr. Revkin of the New York Times, if you think that people are the worst thing that ever happened to planet Earth, why don't you just go kill yourself and save the planet by dying? Oh. And that, that sound clip is out there. You can hear it. Uh, and, and he went on another bit of a rant talking about uh, me as being a, like a jihadist, you know, the equivalent of jihadist, which is really ironic because at that time my older son was in the Israeli army. Um, so I was really bugged by all that one way or the other. Um, at any rate, so that's one extreme. And then there's a liberal uh, blogger, Joe Rahm, a physicist who blogs on climate for um, the, the Center for American Progress, compared, said I had a Charlie Sheen moment at one point because I was so irrationally zoned out about something, which of course I felt I wasn't. So yeah, that's kind of my, my life and it can get tiring. Um, uh, but I, I just, you know, I, I'm a middle child biologically and I don't know whether that's doomed me to always try, try to be a listener uh, as well as, as a blatherer, um, but that's just kind of what I do. Okay, Jared, jump in. Hi, Andrew. I'm Jared. Um, in reading some of your posts, I really like the one about balancing passion and detachment in journalism. Um, so I was wondering, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that um, and just talk about conveying the sense of urgency that surrounds the climate crisis without <coughs> alienating readers who uh, might dismiss it as alarmism and just get chuckled. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm glad you went back to that one. That, that actually came grew out of a speech I gave a number of years back at Willamette University out in uh, Oregon, where they asked, they held a conference on, it was like on the personal and the professional, like how people in different fields uh, balance everything. And they asked me, you know, how, how, how can you be <clears throat> writing about the environment, which you obviously care about, but do it in a detached, objective way. And, and I, and as you probably read, you know, my, my view is that, um, I'm an advocate, as I said, for reality, so I can be very passionate about that. I'm passionate about science. I love the scientific process with all of its faults. It's the best thing we have on basic questions to get us the bedrock that you, that you need to then go forward and make tough societal decisions. The science does not tell you what to do. It just, it just tells you what kind of ball field you're playing on, you know, whether it's soccer or field hockey. So, so um, with all that in mind, I, I, the other thing I learned and that I'm passionate about is to try to distinguish what's what's what we've learned through science and what we what that tells us we can do from the the shoulds. The word should is implicit, implicitly a word imbued with values. Uh, you should use less uh, energy. You should not smoke. You know, if I'm telling you that, I'm I'm imparting my values on on you and. Um, there was a climate scientist, there is a climate scientist named Ken Caldera, who I've interviewed on YouTube before and I've known for, for many years, who I get, he studied uh, philosophy as an undergrad, pretty sure, and he led me to the, um, 
the uh, writings of David Hume, H-U-M-E, who was a philosopher a couple hundred years ago, who uh, wrote essentially that you cannot get an ought from an is. You know, the data is one thing and, and what we do about it is another. And all that's been really valuable and that's what I tried to articulate in that piece. I can be very passionate about the environment, but, but as long as I tell you when I'm talking about my personal views, um, you know, about which fish to save or how aggressively to act on global warming or whether to choose windmills or nuclear plants, those are, those are mostly values decisions. And I think that's all been a really important part of my learning curve. So that's the perfect segue into Queen's question. Queen, jump in. Who exactly do you see as your audience? Like, who are you working to target? And how do you hope to affect them? Because I have a quote in my email signature from writer Teju Cole that says, writing as writing, and then writing as rioting, and then writing as writing, like to write something, to write a wrong. So, and on the best days, all three of them. I, I was in denial for a long time. You know, we talk about climate denial. I was in um, denial about what you can do with information to change things uh, for a long time. Um, and what I mean by that is that there's a body of behavioral research that I've been digging into since 2006 or so that clearly shows that we pick and choose information based on predispositions. And most of us are not changed by new information. In fact, in some cases, as you may have heard, like with vaccination, if you pummel a, an anti-vaxxer with more studies showing how vaccines are safe, it makes that person, it tends to reinforce that person's resistance to having his or her children vac vaccinated. So, so that, you know, as a journalist, you, you look at this and you go, oh my God. So I'm really spending my whole life writing stuff, writing, hoping to write stuff, meaning to make things better. Well, I better get over that in a hurry. So, um, <laughs> But obviously, I haven't stopped writing. I write thousands of words a day, one way or the other, whether it's notes or stuff that gets on the blog. Um, I guess I'm just trying to um, to 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 uh, to memorialize my own learning curve. You know, what what Dot Earth is is not like uh, I, even though I write on the opinion page at the time, the opinion pages of the website. Um, you know, most most opinion bloggers are basically, tell, or I mean, or columnists tell you what to think, and I'm kind of just showing you how I'm thinking. <laughs> and it's sort of an open-ended process. Um, you know, I, I, you just look back at what I've been writing about the last couple of weeks uh, or about um, how warm has it gotten, how, how, how relevant these uh, warm, warm records are uh, if, you're think, if you're trying to track global warming compared to other ways to track it. Um, there's, there's a number of things I've written about where you, you can kind of see how I've learned over time. I, I, there are people I've been exposed to through the blog who I never, whose ideas and research I never would have learned about if I hadn't been blogging. Um, there are con there are pretty stern critics of me on, on each side of these issues who have led me to stuff that I probably wouldn't have been exposed to. So my writing process isn't really just about creating rhetoric that is designed to change things. It's it's an open journal sort of over the shoulder look at, at an honest uh, person trying to navigate complicated questions. So, so it's kind of different than the writing, writing, rioting. And I've done plenty of, you know, I've done crusading journalism. I've done investigative journalism. Those all have a place. They're all very important. But, but they usually are like uh, negating something. Like, like I've gotten people fired from the White House, you know, when I wrote about uh, the muzzling at NASA, of these NASA climate scientists. And, but that's kind of, you know, if I, if I go to my grave having only done negative things like getting people fired I mean it's positive in a way but it's you know what I mean it's not like actually creating something new and good and fresh uh, I don't think I felt like I would feel satisfied so so the blog is about you know increasingly it's about me looking at communication itself as is that a tool that can foster a sustainable human journey and and my answer is usually yes although it's still an open question whether the internet and all this connectivity is um, going to be used for, for good. It can be used for bad, just like ISIS, you know, using YouTube to um, recruit um, extremists with decapitation videos. That shows you pretty vividly this stuff is not just a tool for good. Um, I do think it can be. And so part of what I'm writing about is the, the prospect of using these new networks of communication, whether they're written words or, or video or whatever, um, to make a difference. 
a lot of what I do is explanatory, expository. Uh, you know, when I wrote about um, clamping down on methane leaks, um, and I, you know, I made judgments and said that the, Obama's not going fast enough on regulations. You know, that's really trying to get a specific change in place. But but the overall th thrust is different. So again, a perfect segue. Katie, jump into your question because she's interested in some of the you know uh, techniques you use to um, connect with your readers and the narrative techniques you use. Jump in. Okay, hi, um, I'm Katie. And so in reading some of your blog posts and past uh, articles that you've published, um, I've noticed that one of your kind of trademark reporting styles is the idea of showing science in action. Um, so I was just wondering why you think this style makes a difference when reporting on issues of, uh, related to climate change. Um, and if you've noticed a greater impact from pieces that you've written that have featured uh, more action. Um, and then also, uh, how, how do you go about generating excitement for issues that might not have obviously exciting initiatives to highlight? Two good questions. Um, the second one is tougher. How do, you, how do you make things that are wonky or complicated or fuzzy um, compelling? I, uh, that's, I don't think there's ever an easy answer to that. One of the answers is to try everything. Um, I just um, worked with a, a Pace University senior. For, on her, I was her advisor on her senior thesis. And her thesis was on the uh, increasing use of social media by a big environmental group, the Wildlife Conservation Society. And I'll tell you why this is relevant in a second. Um, one of their initiatives is to cut down on the poaching of elephants in, in um, sub-Saharan Africa. And they've been putting together videos, and some of the videos are funny. Some of them are sweet, kind of, you know, baby elephants with their moms. And, and some of them are incredibly wrenching. There's one with all you hear is the sound of an elephant being shot and screaming. It was a sound recording in a, for, a forest elephants in a remote part of the rainforest in Central African Republic by a, a biologist working there. And so they're, you're basically they're trying everything, you know, happy stuff, funny stuff. And, and wrenching stuff and whatever sticks, uh, you know, they'll go with. Um, so I think that's that's the communication environment we're in now, where you have to try everything. And on my blog, um, you know, I some pieces I do close focus when I've been lucky enough to get out in the field, uh, like when I was with uh, people um, uh, netting um, and tagging sturgeon, these amazing uh, endangered giant fish in the Hudson River. You know, that's just great. I love to show the process of science. One, the main reason I like to show science as process is because it is a process and we have this false sense in, in, the, in our society which has so little scientific literacy that science is just a set of facts sitting on shelves like the structure of DNA is just a fact, you know, um, and that could betrays the learning that led to the elucidation of the structure of DNA and all the persistent questions about DNA and how much of the genome is, is active and relevant, how much of the stuff we used to think was junk DNA now turns out to be important. You know, you know, so if you're not conveying that journey, the science is a journey, then you get people with this false sense of security that, that we know everything, it's just simple facts. Uh, we, if the more than people understand the science's process, the better off we'll be. Now, and now, again, keep in mind, I'm saying that even as I've told you the behavioral work, which is that most people aren't changed by new, new scientific information. So, so you just, I, I don't think that the second thing negates the need to do the first thing. We have, it's, it's all still an all of the above process. We have to do it all. Yeah, it's, we're, we're reading this week, um, or read for this week, Field Notes from a Catastrophe, which does, uh, is another great example of you know, science as process, science as journey. And Paul, you jump in. Paul sure. is, has, has very interesting parallels to your career. Um, you explain. Yeah, so I actually came to Vanderbilt um, just to study biology, just because that was what interested me, and I really liked it, and ended up um, picking up an English major. And now I'm really considering um, doing science writing, or science journalism. Um, and so it's a great birthday present that you're talking to us. It's my birthday today. <laughs> but, um, ah, isn't that great? Yeah. So could you comment on like the importance of your starting out in science and then moving into journalism? Yeah. Although you know, I never actually quite got there. <laughs> I I uh, I got a biology undergraduate degree. I worked in marine fisheries um, every summer. I was in college, um, including my senior year in high school. Um, so I became conversant in science. I 
uh, but I've never published. I've published one paper and one piece in a journal. It's a, a, a commentary in uh, Frontiers of Ecology and Environment on Communication, and one one piece in WMO Bulletin, the Meteorological Organization Bulletin. But that's it. So I'm not a scientist. The yeah. only doctorate I have is an honorary doctorate uh, in the humane letters. So so uh, I mean I, I came at this from the you know when I was a kid I wanted to be a scientist, and right up through. Um, into college, and, and I didn't grow up wanting to be a journalist. I, that came to me when I was in my mid twenties. I'd, I'd been, uh, I was really lucky after college to end up on a sailboat. It's a long story. You could, uh, there's actually a video somewhere. If you just Google for Revkin Wanderlust, that was the name of the boat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll find this thing. Uh, you know, so it was that trip that made me want to be a journalist. I, um, saw the world at a, at a pretty young age, early 20s, and just there's just so much stuff and so much weird stuff, you know, piles of leopard skins on the roadside in Djibouti uh, that I took a picture of, and th that really made me want to kind of tell stories. So I came at, at it, I came into life enamored of science and then migrated slowly over toward um, writing about it. Uh, the other thing was, realistically, I just, the idea of getting a PhD never really thrilled me you know it's too much I'm, I'm more I'm too ADD to get a, to get a PhD as, as I've said before like I, I'm, all, I'm everywhere and and a PhD is like there yeah. <laughs> so I just can't do that um, Maddie jump in with your question it, it's I'll just let you let you I'll do the, the whole thing yeah well I guess you kind of like address this a little bit with Queen's question but more, I guess, about sort of the blogging. Um, I'm interested in your personal shift from print to online journalism. Like, how has blogging and Twitter changed the way you write and report? Many of your blog posts are in response to other articles from the internet and responses by experts to these articles or your questions. So, right. to what extent do you see yourself now mostly as a writer or a curator of ideas? Um, more of a curator and um, ma like um, managing flows of information, helping people sort of navigate. Like just today, um, you know, I, I'm not, I can't make a judgment on why some of those blizzard forecasts went, most of them were wrong, but I sure know who can answer that question. <laughs> and so I'm always, I'm like the, um, uh, uh, again, I'm kind of the middleman uh, in a different way, not, not, not arbitrating arguments, but I'm, um, I know uh, I, I don't know everything, but I know how to answer every question, or at least how to how to, how to get a hold of people who can. And thirty two years of science journalism can do that for you. Um, so so that's right. The blog is not fine art. I mean, sometimes I'll try to do a piece that's more essay style. I, I rarely have time to do that. I'm not paid enough, actually, frankly, to do that. And I, my full time job is teaching communication courses at Pace. So I, you know, the the blog is um, is. Um, uh, essentially like a quarter should be a quarter of my life it's uh, it's always trying to be at least half of my life in terms of my conscious hours um, I always had to beat it back so yeah it is a rough sketch for the most part it's mostly and that's why but I think you know there's such a focus on the now these days that I, I think you need to help people in fairly brisk way navigate what to think about certain things or at least how to think about them the one book I think I want to write still, you know, there's actually lots of books I'd like to write. I haven't written a full-fledged book since 1992, my first book on global warming. <laughs> you know, I wrote a book in 2006 for middle school students, a 20,000-word book about the North Pole and Arctic climate change, but I haven't really written a full-bore book since 1992 and 90. And one reason I haven't circled back to that is because um, um, the blog gives me a big audience, uh, even though it is more flow style audience. Uh, it's not a dig in uh, audience. Um, and um, I, I think in a way the, the issues that I track are so plastic, they're evolving so rapidly that any kind of book I would write this year would be irrelevant next year. My friend Michael Levy wrote a book about um, um, the rise of American energy. Um, and it's already been completely disrupted by the, his thesis has been um, changed uh, dramatically by what's been going on with oil prices and stuff. And, you know, uh, I just can't find the energy to dig in. But I do think I, what I do want to write a uh, book about is 
is is something that gives you it would give you a guide to how to think about this century not a explainer it's not an explainer that's what people don't need anymore uh, because the world's so dynamic you need to make give people the the um, attributes and um, um, capacity to become lifelong learners and to know how to answer questions and to know what Snopes is um, <laughs> then there's you know if I can give people the capacity to become smarter on their own and navigate this century without feeling totally freaked out all the time um, that, that's kind of what a, my next book will be about so I'm not sure if that's answered your question in a way I drifted but but I think at least it gives us a rough sense of what I'm I pri what what keeps sort of luring me back to blogging even though it's kind of surfacey yeah, it, uh, that's a really interesting, I'm so glad that you took a detour on your answer because I, I think that's a brilliant book idea. And um, Christy, um, jump in here too. I mean, I like that you gestured at the sort of richer sensory experience that we get from storytelling online. And Christy has a question about that as it relates specifically to the environment, uh, co environment coverage. Go ahead. How broadly is the internet changing the way we understand the climate story. It's interesting that so much climate storytelling is moving online and that an outlet like InsideClimateNews.com can win the Pulitzer. Why do you think this shift is happening towards an online platform for the best environmental journalism? And what are your favorite online, outfit, uh, online outlets for environmental news? Uh, well, yes, the, these daily digests like um, Climate Nexus and Inside Climate News, which does also its own reporting, are really valuable now and they demonstrate a lot of things about how the, the world of information and even the world of journalism have become um, um, flat that anyone with skills uh, can jump in and create meaningful content um, there's other examples of this uh, during the Colorado fires a couple of years ago it was um, sort of an informal journalism network did some of the best reporting on w why there was so much vulnerable structures and fire zones, the red zone, and um, you look at the rise of the other entities like ProPublica, and you can see that uh, the, the, the great big old behemoths are no longer, they're still wonderful. I mean, the New York Times is amazing. What, what we did on Ebola this past year was just stunning. And that shows you um, that there's still a vital need for, for empowered traditional journalism. But uh, Inside Climate News shows you that you can be an upstart startup, upstart startup, that's kind of fun, and, and, and really do some meaningful stuff. Um, and I think that's really encouraging in many ways. Um, we only have three more questions. I know you, you've got to bounce back to your work, but um, uh, Sada, jump in, because of course you write about things that are, uh, that, that are not exclusively uh, uh, about the environment. Go ahead. You recently wrote about gender inequalities amongst scientists, um, and I wondered like, about what um, stray from topics strictly related to the environment, and why do you see that as necessary? I, I don't even consider myself an environmental journalist, really. I mean, my beat, when you really look at Dot Earth, uh, the way I, we should go back to the very beginning, it's a blog that, it's, it's a reporting effort around a question. And the question is, how do we head toward roughly 9 billion people by 2050 with the fewest regrets? That's the question. And so um, the things that matter are, again, kind of delineated by science. Like, how do we not use up uh, the rainforests? How do we not overheat the climate? How do we not ruin coral reefs? How do we not um, uh, kill each other um, unnecessarily? And when you look at the root causes, many times they're they're not they're social. They're not they're not um, uh, scientific. Uh, girls' education. If I could go on one trip this year, it would be to Nigeria to write about girls' education, because Nigeria, as Nigeria goes, so goes Africa's population in the next forty years. And um, you know, when you look at Boko Haram and what they've done to try to discourage girls' education, it's horrific. Um, Nigeria has problems with its traditional education system, but they're getting more girls into school. The, uh, the more girls go through high school, specifically through high school, the, the lower fertility rates get. That really changes people's lives in fundamental ways. So if I'm not writing about prospects for girls and, and women, um, I'm really neglecting my question if, it, if population growth in vulnerable places is part of the question, and it certainly is. So um, in terms of like um, why women aren't very well represented in meteorology, that's a little of a bit of a drift. 
But I, I do think it matters, you know, um, uh, uh, having a full range of perspectives and, and um, making sure that all of society, you know, the full range of qualified people can do uh, important jobs is important. <laughs> My dog <laughs> with a squeaky toy. Can we see? Uh, let me see. Mickey, what you got? Oh. <laughs> oh, he dropped it. Wait, go on. Go get it. Hey, Jack. <laughs> Maybe my son involved again. Uh, so, so anyway, that's what I think. That sort of is, that gets to the point you're you're asking about, which is uh, you know quite. I'll, I write a lot about education. I try as much as I can. Innovation in education, uh, literacy. Um, if we're just looking at like balding men giving us analysis of of what's up with hurricanes or 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 or, or um, snowstorms, that that's not really an encouragement for for girls to get into science. Um, so so that's part of yeah, you know, it's it is there to some extent. Okay, so uh, Alice, I want you to jump in, and then we'll go to your banjo. Um, uh, um, you know, this is this is an impossible question to answer, but it has to be asked. Um, so, um, Alice, jump in. Hi, I'm Alice. Um, so, I'm just wondering what you make of the Senate's recent 98 to 1 vote that climate change actually does exist. It finally happened 16 years after the first IPCC report. Uh, do you think this is exciting? Or is it just kind of depressing? Oh, and God. Yeah, it was generally. Well, it was, you know, the, when you look at the vote, it was actually designed by their. By, um, the Inhofe side of things, um, basically, he's saying climate always is changing. <laughs> so it was all about it's all about definition. That whole question, so many questions in this arena, the heated part of this arena, are um, related to how you define your terms of your debate. And um, everybody I know who's even remotely um, uh, engaged in a, in, a, in a real way on the skeptic side acknowledges that climate has warmed whether they you know they'll have all these arguments about the last 15 years or so but th that's not the time scale that matters for climate change and the the more uh, the question is how dangerous is it or the bigger question is what do you do about it and how how quickly and at, at what cost those questions produce really big divisions right away but the question of is the climate warming and even the question of are humans contributing um, those are even Michael Crichton, who wrote this State of Fear book a number of years ago before he died. You know the Jurassic Park um, author, um, who was very, very ag aggressively angry at Al Gore and environmentalists for overstating things. He he never denied that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and is warming the planet. He just said it's not a serious problem. So so that's why it's very easy to get a Senate vote like that actually. Uh, and and then I mean Inhofe was just making the point that. Um, it's always changing. <laughs> that you know, he's just sort of kowtowing to his his most um, conservative religious base uh, there. That we couldn't possibly do God's work and change the planet. Uh, that which is a separate question. So, but but really, when you step back, the question of is 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 global warming real? That's really not the question, and that's not even the the question that engaged people in this debate are even asking. It's how, how, how dangerous is, is it and what do you do about it? Those are the questions that really matter. I would love to hear um, you shred that very <laughs> I came from old New England shores. I miss the salty tides. My friends from Rocky Mountains high, they crave their starry skies. Some flock to California towns where sunsets glow like gale. But it's Hudson River banks and hills that make my soul set sail. From Breakneck Ridge to the Bear Mountain Bridge and all that lies between. In autumn's gold and winter snow and spring and summer's green. From Breakneck Ridge to the Bear Mountain Bridge and all that lies between. In autumn's golden winter snows and spring and summer's green. 
I've been around this whole wide world. I've been up toward the pole. But when I die, please let me lie in Hudson Valley soil. From Great Neck Ridge to the Bear Mountain Bridge and all that lies between. In autumn's gold and winter snows and spring and summer's green. From Great Neck Ridge to the Bear Mountain Bridge and all Cold and winter snows and spring and summer spring. Wow! I left out a verse, but you can find that all on YouTube. The, the longer uh, it has a there's a verse in there about the geological history of the Hudson Islands. A billion years of time and toil are etched in these old hills. Carved by, uh, carved by ice and dynamite, but they stand firm here still. I even fact-checked my songs. <laughs> so uh, it's a billion years. <laughs> so anyway, it's been great to uh, spend some time with you.